if you take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter number one. Last week we began our study in this book, and this morning we are picking up on verse number 9 and reading down through verse number 13. And so the, the penman Mark gives us the, these details of what was taking place surrounding the gospel of Jesus Christ who he identifies as the Son of God. He says in verse number 9, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, With you, I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. You'll notice that the title of the message this morning is Prelude to ministry. Our Lord actually begins his ministry, as we'll see next time down in verse number 14. But here we have the prelude to ministry, an introduction, a formal introduction to the ministry. And as you can easily see, and if you were to just read through chapter 1 of Mark, but if you read the entire book of Mark, you would understand that Mark is a book of action. And already in this short time of our study of the gospel, we have quickly moved from discussing John the Baptist as the predicted messenger who was tasked with preparing the hearts of the people for the coming Messiah to what we see today of the baptism of Jesus and then immediately the wilderness temptation of Jesus in the wild. And if you read the rest of chapter 1, and if you read the whole gospel of of Mark, all the way through chapter 16, you would see that Mark continues to portray Jesus Christ as a man of action, as a man who gets things done. Again, we're talking about a fast-moving gospel. Notice how it goes in chapter 1. He begins his public ministry. in in verses 14 through 15. Then in verses 16 through 20, he calls his disciples. In verses 21 through 28, he heals a man possessed by unclean spirits. Then he heals Peter's mother-in-law of sickness and many others with illnesses and are either demon-oppressed or demon-possessed. Then in verses 35 through 39, he travels back to Galilee and engages in his preaching ministry and casting out ministry there. And then lastly, in verses 40 through 45, he heals a man of the dreaded disease of leprosy. All of these things that Mark is trying to portray is showing that this gospel is fast moving and that Jesus Christ is a man of action. Another way that Mark emphasizes this fast action to his Roman audience, and by the way, his Roman audience appreciated action and appreciated power, power like that which Jesus demonstrated when he was healing or when he was casting out demons. So Mark begins to emphasize this fast action by using words like immediately or using the word and. Let me just show you that. In verse number 10, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opened. Down in verse number 12, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. In verse number 18, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Verse number 20, 
And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. In verse number 21, and they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath. In verse number 29, and immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Down in verse number 30. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And then if we jump all the way down to verse number 42, we see, and immediately the leprosy left him. Again, what is Mark trying to do? He's conveying that this is going to be a fast-moving gospel. And he's doing it not only in the short sound bites that he gives us concerning the life of Jesus, but also in using words and devices like the word immediately and the word and. And we can see that if you would read chapter 1, you can see how many times the word and is used to move the narrative along. So these devices that Mark gives to us depicts Jesus once again as a man who gets things done, as one who is accomplishing great things. And again, in the mind of the Roman audience this would be attractive. Still another impression that we get from this book is that there is a definite plan being followed. The events and the activities of our Lord are not accidental and they're not random. For instance, the prophecies of Scripture are being fulfilled. Look back in verse 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So the prophecy that we have in the book of Isaiah is immediately being fulfilled in verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance. And so we get the impression here of a definite plan fulfilling the prophecy. The events and the activities of the Lord are not accidental. They're not random. Jesus appears then on the scene as well. He appears at the right place at the right time. And according to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15, he appears to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. There was a purpose for the time in which he was appearing before John. Jesus then is definitely following the divine plan. His baptism is is accompanied by the Spirit's descent in verse number 10. The Father endorses the Son's willing participation in God's plan in verse number 11. He submits, Jesus submits to the Spirit's control as he is led by the Spirit into conflict with the devil in verses 12 through 13. In other words, nothing is left to chance. Everything moves towards the divine end, and we know that the divine end is the cross. So the plan of redemption is steadily unfolded for us In the Gospel of Mark, everything has a purpose. And brothers and sisters, as we've prayed and as we've sung, it is good for us to remember this, that the things that take place in life may appear to be random and they may appear to be unrelated, but they are not. Today, as we look across the oceans and as we see war taking place in the Ukraine, it's quite easy for us to think that is a random event that's just happening in history. And we tend to think of the same thing in regard to our own lives, that things just kind of happen and that the things around us are somewhat random. Brothers and sisters, there's not a single molecule, as R.C. Sproul would say, there's not a single molecule in this universe that is not under the control of our sovereign God. And everything in history moves towards the end of that which God has purposed from all eternity. 
And we need to understand that and be reminded of that. God is the sovereign of the universe, and he is working all things after his will. I want you to see that and be reminded of it by turning, if you will, to the book of Revelation, chapter number 4. In Revelation chapter number 4, the Apostle John, again writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sets down before us in picture form the sovereignty of God the Father in chapter 4. Everything in chapter 4 circles around and revolves around the throne of God. Notice it. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard standing to, speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the four living, fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say looking towards the throne, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Everything circles around the sovereignty of our God. Then in chapter number 5, we see the plan of God being worked out as the scroll, the title deed of the universe, is handed to the Lamb, the Son of God who was slain, and He is the only one who is able to unseal that document. That is, the very history of humanity is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in verse 1 of chapter 5, Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it because God's plan would not be fulfilled or realized. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne... And the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song saying worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth God's plan will be fulfilled Even the evil that occurs 
our God turns to accomplish his purposes. And this is no more plainly declared than in the Apostle Peter's message on the day of Pentecost when he said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed. And of course we know that this whole idea of God turning that which is evil into good. By the way, no greater good could have occurred that day than for the Lord Jesus Christ to have laid down his life and giving it to save a sinful humanity. But the same thing can happen in the lives of individual Christians as well, right? That God will turn that which is evil to good The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So as we, brothers and sisters, immerse ourselves in this fast-moving pace of the Gospel of Mark, I want you to keep in mind that there is a definite plan being followed. Now, immediately after we are told of John's ministry of baptizing and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, in verse number 9, Jesus enters the picture. John had been ministering to the hearts of the people, ministering in such a way that their hearts were to be prepared for the Lord. They were to make straight his paths. And now Jesus, who had lived a private life in obscure, in the obscure town of Nazareth, Jesus goes public. And that's what we see in verse 9 at his baptism. We see the Messiah's inauguration. We have in Jesus' baptism a formal and public prelude to the launching of his official ministry. Up until this point, and Jesus is presently, according to Luke chapter 3, in verse 23, Jesus in verse number 9 is at age 30. But up until this point, the Lord lived a private life in relative obscurity. Except for the details surrounding the birth that is given to us in the Gospel of Matthew and in Luke chapter 1 and 2, and I and in addition, the time in which Jesus went down to Jerusalem at age 12, except for the details surrounding his birth and that time in Jerusalem at age 12, the scripture says little about our Lord's early life. We know he learned carpentry from his father Joseph. He's called the carpenter in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. Joseph is talked about as the carpenter in Matthew 13, verse 55. We also know that Nazareth was so obscure that it was doubted by some that the Christ could even come from the region of Galilee, the region in which the town Nazareth was located. And it appears, if you read the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verses 31 and 33, that John the Baptist, though he was related to Jesus, did not actually know Jesus by sight. So when Jesus appeared on the scene to be baptized, he was not immediately recognized. And such was our Lord's private life. But now, in those days, as our text says, at the height of John's baptizing ministry, Jesus goes public. So imagine the Messiah 
the Christ, the Son of God, living for 30 years in relative obscurity, unknown, basically, to the public. Mark says in verse number 9 that Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan. The baptism then marked the line between the Lord's private and his public life. It was the Messiah's, it was the new king's inauguration. But we should be quick to note here that Jesus did not come to be baptized by John in the same way as all the others had. So you remember when John was baptizing that the towns were emptying and people were lining up and flowing to John to be baptized and confessing their sins and being baptized for repentance. They were coming confessing their sins and they were coming in their sinfulness. But Jesus had no sinfulness. Jesus had no sins to confess. So Jesus coming to John was totally different from that of all the others. He was sinless. Jesus never sinned in thought, word, or deed. Jesus never violated the law of God. Jesus always fulfilled the very will of God, never violating at any moment in his life so that he did not sin at all. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this, Jesus was one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Brothers and sisters and friends, we can't say that. No man could have ever said that or can say that. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has been sinless. And this is why we find in Matthew's account of the the baptism that John the Baptist was so opposed to Jesus' baptism. John's reaction serves to confirm the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. John would have prevented him saying this, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? John recognized his own sinfulness, but somehow knew that the Lord, that the Messiah was sinless. Brothers and sisters, Jesus' sinlessness is one essential that made his future substitutionary sacrifice on the cross acceptable to God. He was the spotless lamb of God that had come to take away the sin of the world. Matthew's account goes on to tell us how Jesus eased John's opposition to the baptism. So you can imagine here the two related standing in the water and John is hesitant, reluctant, resistant to baptizing Jesus Christ, and they're having this dialogue. I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to be baptized by me? It can't be. It can't be. But Jesus eases John's reluctance and told him, let it be so now in the Gospel of Matthew, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Take that in. Jesus is saying to John, John, this is a necessary thing in order for me to fulfill all righteousness. Now, a righteous person like John would have to say, Amen. Okay. If you are here to fulfill all righteousness, and this is essential for it, I yield to you. I will baptize you. 
In order for Christ's work on the cross to be successful, he had to be sinless. In order for the believer to be declared righteous on the basis of Christ's work on the cross, Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness. It is his perfect righteousness that is imputed to the one who believes that enables the Christian to stand righteous before God. Brothers and sisters, don't miss it. We can never stand right before God on the basis of anything we have done or will do. The only way that anyone can ever stand right before God is for Christ's righteousness to be imputed to that person so that God sees that person through Jesus Christ's righteousness and accepts him on the basis of his son. And that's also the reason why there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Satan cannot accuse us before God because we are righteous in Jesus Christ who was perfectly righteous before God. What then did Jesus' baptism signify? As I said earlier, The baptism set the dividing line between Jesus' private and public life. And by being baptized by John, Jesus was identifying with those who were acknowledging their sinfulness and their need of forgiveness. It reminds me of the time that the Pharisees would question him about healing the sinner And he said, it wasn't the righteous that needed a physician, but the sinful. We're saying that to the Pharisees who were thinking of themselves as performing the law of God, and therefore they were right before God, and therefore they saw no need for a Savior. That is, they saw no need for Jesus Christ. But the sinner who recognizes his sin realizes he's also hopeless to do anything about his sin outside of trusting in Jesus Christ. And so at the baptism, Jesus is identifying with those who are acknowledging their sinfulness and their need of forgiveness. And though he himself was sinless, he was manifestly indicating that he was entering into his redemptive mission by his baptism, by the symbolic act of baptism. Death and resurrection were yet three years away, three years down the road, but was now symbolized through baptism. His baptism, therefore, signified his messianic role as the suffering servant. You know that prophecy, don't you, in Isaiah 53? Let's look at it. This is the suffering servant. By the way, the Jew today still cannot equate Isaiah 53 with the Lord Jesus Christ. For some reason, in their blindness, they do not do it. But here we have, depicted by Isaiah, the suffering servant and his role. Beginning in verse number 3, he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief with his soul makes When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offering. He shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. His baptism signified his messianic role as the suffering servant. So be sure... Be sure to understand the importance of this occasion that Mark gives us. Jesus had arrived on the public horizon to enter into the redemptive ministry decreed from all eternity. He was, at the age of 30, submitting himself to the Father's will and purpose for sending him in the first place. He came to die. He came to die on the cross. He came to die for sins. It is no surprise given this understanding then to encounter what we do next in the text. For in verses 10 through 11, Mark records the divine affirmation in verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. This was not some mystical experience that was only taking place in the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. The event had witnesses. Not only did Jesus see the Spirit's descent, so did John. And in John chapter 1, verse 32, it says, And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. It's even possible that others who were present witnessed this event as well. The heavens rent open. I, I, I take that, I visualize that. If, you, if you've watched any um, tennis matches, indoor tennis matches, or any indoor tennis, football games where the roof would separate. I visualize this kind of like that, that the heavens rent open and God the Holy Spirit gently descended and rested upon Jesus, not as a dove, but like a dove. It was a visible affirmation of the Lord's symbolic act of entering into his redemptive mission. But that was not all that happened. Those who saw the visible affirmation of the Spirit heard the audible affirmation that came from God the Father. And it says in John chapter 1, 31 through 34, as well here, And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Brothers and sisters, here we have at the baptism the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. The one God who is three eternal persons. All three persons of the Godhead manifestly show up for the baptism. God the Son, bodily. God the Spirit, like a dove. And God the Father, as a voice. Now how reassuring this must have been for the Lord Jesus, right? 
the Spirit's anointing and empowering ministry and the Father's verbal and audible affirmation would have comforted and assured the heart of the Savior. The Father's approval coincided with the Son's commitment to His redemptive mission, which was signified in His baptism and by His baptism. The Son was always willing to fulfill all the Father's will for him. Even at the most difficult hour in the garden leading up to the cross, our Lord's submission to the Father's will was expressed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. The baptism was the Messiah's inauguration. The Spirit's descent and the Father's audible approval was the divine affirmation. But the prelude of our Lord's ministry continues with what we see in verses 12 and 13. It continues in the adversary's temptation. If the baptism was the Messiah's inauguration and the Spirit's descent was the new king's, let's say, coronation, anointing, then you might naturally expect that there would follow some kind of national celebration. This is not the case with the suffering servant who came to fulfill all righteousness. Immediately, Mark says, the same spirit that anointed the Lord drove him out into the wilderness in verse 12. Matthew's account says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So for 40 days, our text tells us that Jesus was in an inhospitable environment being tempted to sin by Satan. The Apostle Paul refers to our Lord in the book of 1 Corinthians 15 refers to him as the second Adam. What he tells us in that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, in essence, is that he came to undo all the damage that the first Adam did by falling into sin. That when the first Adam succumbed to the serpent's temptation, he was in the perfect environment for man. He was in a beautiful garden. He could eat of every tree but one, apparently at any time. He had a perfect companion in Eve. All the animals were under his dominion, and he was not alone. But this was not the case with Christ, the second Adam. He was driven in a rugged, to, into a rugged, hostile environment. He was alone. He was surrounded by wild beasts such as wild boars, hyenas, jackals, wolves, foxes, leopards, even lions. Alone in the wilderness with wild animals. And Mark is the only one that includes that detail. Instead of a perfect environment, the wilderness, perfectly as Ferguson writes, Perfect writes perfectly depicts the fallen, broken, sinful, disintegrated world. And this is the world the Savior came to restore and into which he came to redeem a people for God. And friends, brothers and sisters, our Savior still redeems and saves people. All who repent of sin, like the ones who would travel to see John and get into the water with John and confess their sin before John and be immersed in the waters of baptism, all who would repent of of his or her sin and put trust for salvation in the person and work of Jesus Christ God says they will be saved from their sins and have forgiveness of God and be declared righteous before the eternal God. They must repent and they must believe in Jesus Christ. 
Have you? That's the only appropriate response to the Savior. Have you repented of your sin and put your trust for salvation in Jesus Christ alone? Our text teaches us that the Messiah's ministry, our Lord's ministry, would be contested. In this case, if, if Satan prevailed and our Lord, like Adam, the first Adam, sinned, he would not be fit to be the Savior of the world. In fact, and I say this respectfully, if our Savior had sinned that day, he too would have needed a Savior. For he no longer would have been fit to be the Savior. From the Matthew, from the Gospel of Matthew and Luke's accounts, we find that the most severe temptations by the devil came at the end of the 40 days. Jesus had not eaten during the entire period, so physically he would be at his weakest and spiritually at his most vulnerable. But as we know, Jesus did not fail, he did not fall. He did not sin, and Luke's gospel says the devil departed from him until an opportune time. There would be other occasions in which Satan would personally contest our Lord's ministry of of dying the death of the cross and resurrecting to save all who would ever repent and believe in him. But our text in Mark signals our Lord's success in the wilderness as the angels were ministering to him in verse 13. Such, brothers and sisters, was the prelude to ministry for the one who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this story rejoices the heart. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the invitation is there as Jesus would say, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Repent and believe in him and you'll be saved. Let's pray. Thank you for giving us the gospel of Mark. Thank you for giving us the gospel. Thank you for sending the Lord Jesus that we sinful man could have life through him. Lord, we pray that you bless your word now. Thank you for the richness of it. Strengthen us through it, we pray. Be glorified in all that is done. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.